the network. Oh, what's up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and we're back for another link up with Brand Man. And today, I'm linking up with DJ Dreamos. This dude is dope, man. He's a producer of a show that y'all probably know about, which is The Breakfast Club. So obviously he's doing something and he's a part of something that's already impacting the culture at large. But it's not just that. He's still trying to find his way through the game. So I think it's an interesting insight to be in a space that he's already in, but still trying to continue to carve and not be complacent. And he has a podcast that he actually had me on called the Dream Doc Dealers Podcast. And he's interviewed a lot of dope people on there. So we're going to get into that, the podcast, why it exists, some of the interviews he's done there, and then just some of the learnings he's had, some of the games, some of the inside game he's had based on his position at the Breakfast Club as well. So DJ Dramos, welcome, man. I appreciate you doing with this. Matter of fact, I appreciate you having me on, on your podcast first and foremost. But what's up, man? How you doing? I'm good, bro. Now, of course, man. I, I appreciate you doing mine. I, that was one of my favorite episodes I got to do. So uh, I actually learned some stuff myself. So that was that was a good one. Hey, hey. Okay. So uh, let's start here, <laughs> man. Because All right. I, I want to know, like, where did you, like, what, how did you get to where you are? Like, how does one go from? <sighs> All right, you, you had your name is DJ Dreamos, so I'm assuming that you were mm -hmm. you, you were doing records in a club or something at some point, or you wanted to be a DJ and then maybe you pivoted, or are you still trying to DJ heavily to somebody who's producing at the Breakfast Club, right? How did how does that transition happen? Did you even want to be in music? Yeah, I mean, I always played music. I always, uh, you know, I played instruments and things like that. Um, and, and uh, I'd originally actually played in bands and then um, I had just kind of always been into all kinds of music. So I always wanted to find ways to express myself. And once I stopped doing the whole band thing, I kind of got interested in DJing and we're taking it more seriously. I had always had an interest. I had like turntables at the house, but I just kind of messed around in my basement. Um, and that kind of sort of led me to this path right now, you know. So once I started DJing, it just made me have to pump out there a lot, you know. So I was out in the club meeting people. I was meeting other DJs, uh, promoters, this and that. And I would just DJ anything I could, you know, kind of get my hands on at the time. And I would just go right, and right, meet right. people as, as much as I possibly could. Like, if there was an opportunity to meet somebody that was doing something that I found interesting or was one of my peers or any of those, those kind of things, I was out. You know, if I wasn't working as uh, on a Friday or Saturday night or Thursday, I was out at a bar or a club, uh, you know, in the New York, New Jersey area just trying to meet people. Um, and through that, I, you know, met somebody who worked at one of our sister radio stations here in New York called KTU. Um, and, you know, through years of just kind of nurturing that relationship and becoming close friends with him and, and his whole crew and essentially meeting everybody that worked at the radio station, um, that led to me getting like a really entry level position at the radio station, just like monitoring the, the boards overnight from like midnight to 6 a.m. Uh, at the, that radio station. But then that kind of got me in the door. And that would eventually lead me to getting the connection to, to get on the breakfast club, basically. So, well, I want to pause there for you. You talked about you moderating the board overnight. What does that look like for somebody who doesn't come from that world? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's a really boring job, to be honest. I just, you're, you're one of the only people in the building at that time. So um basically you know I'll go in at like 11 30 whatever it is uh try to go in a little earlier just so i can kind of like catch the last shift of people you know so i can kind of you know get some some time in with them um but then you're there by yourself you know midnight 6 a.m just kind of monitoring the board making sure that transitions between songs and everything are smooth and, and tight and the commercials and all that stuff hit properly um but really that at that time there, there's nothing else to do you just kind of sit there you know uh and while I was there, I was on my computer, you know, all night watching a breakfast sub interviews, ironically, and like <laughs> kind of mapping out, you know, what I wanted to do and, and just learn the game, you know, and, and just being in the building like that, I would stick around, you know, in the morning for a little bit. Even if I was tired. I would come in, you know, even extra early some days and like I would video interviews for other radio jocks just to kind of keep getting my name in there and, and keep putting myself in there. And that, that's kind of all the little things, you know, I did. Uh all right, we're back. Just wanted to make sure we had the best audio visual quality possible. And yeah, you, you talked about just the, all right, that overnight grind, mm -hmm. trying to figure out your next move. And really, it being born, you knew you didn't want to be there. What, obvi so obviously, you had to do good enough for what you were doing 
for mm-hmm. the, the connection to even matter though, right? Like, did yeah. you, did you like, were you excelling on the boards? Were you telling people in this time that I want to do something bigger or did it kind of all organically happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I walked into it knowing, like, I, I, you know, it was getting paid basically minimum wage, you know what I'm saying? So I walked into it knowing that I, this was my chance to get a foot in the industry, you know what I mean? Um, and that was the way I approached it the entire time, regardless of what, how, you know, the hours were trash and the pay and all that stuff. I, I went into it with a purpose. I knew from the start, like, this is going to be my entryway into doing the things I want to do and I just have to suck it up for now, you know? So I think people recognize that attitude. They saw that, they, they saw the drive. They saw that anytime they needed me to do something, I was there. Um, you know, I would sleep on the floor. If I, you know, I would do anything. I would, I would be sleeping in people's offices under their desks, you know, uh, because they need the coverage in a couple hours. You know what I'm saying? So I did everything I had to do. Um, yeah. So from that, you know, then, you know, with that, you start being on the top of people's minds when things, you know, happen, when opportunities come about because you're that guy who's always there and always showing up, you know, you start being somebody who is on in you know, the top of somebody's mind when an opportunity comes. And, and that's kind of, you know, always been the, my path. Bet. So that's a key right there. Just, especially when you're, you're starting off, just be yeah. available, be present, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, and, and don't get caught up in like the short term of it. Like, you know, I did a lot of stuff where maybe I wasn't getting paid to do it, you know, or, um, or I was exhausted or, you know, it, it wasn't like really worth the time that I was putting into it, you know, but I, I did it, you know, and, and I, cause I knew the long-term vision, you know, was, it was going to pan out if I just kept doing this, you know, I didn't allow myself to get caught up on the fact that maybe I was losing money going back and forth so much, you know, and all the tolls and everything that I, I kind of just, you know, sat there and I, I realized that, that the long-term vision was bigger than that. And, you know, I just always kept that in the forefront of my mind and allowed that to be what, you know, guided me when it came to saying yes to whatever random thing they asked me to do. Oh, so, okay. So like, I mean, we were, as we spoke and you were talking about the fact that you really want to focus on stories, right. Mm-hmm. In, in your career and particularly as you continue to elevate and being one of those personalities that can tap into the culture, find those stories and help deliver those stories in whatever formats yeah. you, you know, decide to explore being on the breakfast club. Obviously that's just one of the outlets where so many stories for the culture have, have come from my Absolutely. curiosity, man, is especially knowing the impact of story narrative that, that mm-hmm. when it comes to artists, when it comes to just public figures, what did you learn or what have you learned um, in terms of delivering a great story? Like how, how, uh, what lessons have you learned as being in that environment so far? I mean, I, I think it all, all starts with honesty, you know, with yourself. I think one of the, the good things I think about them is that people know they already put themselves out there. You know what I mean? They talk about their own personal lives a lot. You know, they critique each other. You know, they do a lot of things like that where, I feel like whoever they're interviewing comes into there knowing that, you know, not only are they being put on display, but at least the people asking the questions aren't hiding anything either, you know? Um, And I think Mm. that there's a level of of comfortability that comes along with that. And I also think they've built, they've built a reputation where they know that, you know, um, these guys aren't going to shy away from the hard questions. So, you know, they know coming into there that, that they have to expect that, you know what I mean? Um, I, I've worked on a, a couple of different radio programs and things like that. And a lot of times the bigger artists will, their PR people will give like a list, like, don't ask these questions. Don't talk about the this, blah, blah, <laughs> you know? And yeah. the, the, the breakfast club is the only show that I've seen that would kind of, you know, just say that to hell with that, you know what I mean? They'll ask what they want to ask, you know? Um, mm. and, and there's something to that, you know, there's something to the honesty. And at the same time, I think they do a good job of balancing that out. They, they, they do a good job of, letting you know that they're not asking these questions necessarily it's like embarrassed you or anything like that they're doing it really for for the culture because these are what the people this is what the people want to hear you know and they're giving you an outlet and a platform to share your side of the story you know and they do a good job of um making the guests feel comfortable in a way that, that we're not trying to you know pin you in a bad light or anything like that we're we're asking the question that people want to know and then we're giving you you know that platform to share your story so it's, it's all about the way i think you make somebody comfortable that's one thing i've noticed is the way they go about interviewing somebody, you know, it, it, it's a very tactical kind of thing. You know, you, you're very tactical about the way you talk to somebody. You want them to feel comfortable in the environment so that they're able to, you know, open up to, you know, answer the questions that you're asking, especially when it comes to like those tougher things. Interesting. I never thought about the idea of, yeah, being open yourself as an interviewer or mm-hmm. just a figure 
So now you're kind of on even kill with right. that person who's being interviewed. I can definitely see how that creates a whole nother level of comfort, especially for the more celebrity type figures who are, right. you know, everything is so exposed and vulnerable when you're almost a celebrity in and a, you know, kind of yourself, it kind of even mm -hmm. certain things out in, in its yeah. own way. Absolutely. I mean, you, you got to think like, you know, you have somebody like Charlamagne talking about dealing with mental health or, you know, getting molested as a kid or then him and Envy going on air and talking about, you know, when they had problems with their wives and cheating and all these things. So it's like, yeah, that was crazy. When he did that, 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 like, I can, that meant a lot for me. So, you know, right. I can get that. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. So you come in and you're like, man, like these guys have laid it all out there, you know? So at that point it's like, what am I hiding? You know what I mean? These, these guys are, you know, asking me personal questions, but at the same time, they've put themselves out there as well. So there is like this give and take that has happened, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't feel as malicious, man. I mean, right. so you have, now that I think about it, this really unique perspective, mm -hmm. right? Observation, right? Uh, so for so long, even when I grew up, right, yeah. I was pretty much introverted, still technically by nature and introverted, but yeah. I would just be so quiet and observe, observe, observe. And because yeah, of your position, right? At, at, yeah. Like, because they're always talking, Right. Mm -hmm. But your position is pretty much listening and watching mm -hmm. and right. All these interviews that you've gotten to see, I would love to know your perspective from mm -hmm. not only the interviewer perspective now, like we kind of talked on that, but like, let's say the artist, the politician, the, you know, you name it type of celebrity from your perspective, just being a quiet person in the room and watching these interactions. What do you think is the difference between an interview that comes off authentic and even makes impact and mm -hmm. people's interviews who don't come off as well in those more conversational unorthodox environments like the Rebus Club? I mean, I think to a degree, it starts when the artist just walks in the building. So, I mean, a little like behind mm -hmm. the scenes tidbit I can give you is, you know, um, Charlemagne always makes it a point to go. Like, so when they come in, there's like a little waiting area right outside of our studio. They could see us and we'd see them, but you know, they're like sitting in the living Oh, hold up. Hold up, hold up. Out Can you repeat that real quick? Yeah. Because it, it like slow it down. Pause. Um, so when the artist comes in, they, they have like a little waiting area, but it's basically just like a living room in our in our section of the building. So uh, we could see them in our studio and they could see us. Our, our windows are glass. So, but Charlamagne will make a point to leave the studio and go like greet them. You know what I'm saying? In the living room. He'll greet them, all, everybody in their entourage, this and that. So I think little things like that, mm. um, you know, sort of start putting people at ease a little bit um and and i think uh you know just you know you're, you're talking about like the the perspective of um if you want to repeat the question a little bit but uh, the perspective of what i'm seeing when i'm watching yeah, yeah i'm talking about the perspective now like if mm -hmm. let's just say i'm I don't know, Jay Z, right? And what I makes them different, in, right? Is that, that, that yeah, what right? makes a difference for me to be the figure right. and give off a good interview versus one of the interviews right. that don't come off either it comes off horrible or it just doesn't doesn't have any impact. It doesn't feel the the same. Right. Okay. So, like I said, with the living room thing, where they come and say he says hi to everybody immediately off the cuff, you're getting that respect level. You feel respected. You feel seen. You feel honored. You know what I mean? So, as mm -hmm. an artist, you're probably gonna let your guard down. Artist, politician, whatever, whatever the case. Uh, Maybe. And then also, I think as an interviewer, you can't be so hungry or thirsty to create a moment that you, you know, don't go through the levels of this interview. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, okay. You have to allow the conversation to go where it goes. You know what I mean? Like, you can write down, like, some questions that you want to ask, but you can't be married to those questions. You know what I mean? Because when you're married to that, you're missing out on the actual conversation that's happening, you know? Um, so there will be times where maybe they had a, he had some questions, Charlotte had some questions, Envy, and it just didn't get to it because the conversation didn't go there. It doesn't mean that the interview ended up being bad. Sometimes it ends up being better than expected. Um, but you have to allow the conversation to go there and you have to also be not so focused on what your next question is that you forget to listen to what they're saying. Cause you might say something that then sparks the next question. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't planned, but you said something interesting that sparks the next thing. Now all of a sudden we're down like this rabbit hole where I might be, you know, uh, giving you all these tidbits information that wasn't even planned on, you know what I mean? So you have to allow yourself to, to keep it conversational. Got you. Yeah, man, I think the conversational and paying attention to the moment is, is huge because mm -hmm. one of the things that attracted to me 
to the Breakfast Club when it first really started moving is like this media culture of yeah. when an artist or you know somebody goes on a media run and they're being asked the exact same questions at every right. single stop. <laughs> yeah, like, bro, and it'll be like the most generic questions, you know, really everything they want you to know from a PR standpoint and nothing right. that makes it worth watching. It really is almost like a, you know, 30 minute ad sometimes. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, if you notice a lot of their interviews, they won't sit there and talk about like, you know, the movie that somebody's promoting or the album, the entire length of the interview or like for too long, you know what I'm saying? They'll, they'll get into a real conversation and then a lot of times they'll kind of end it talking about that thing. So it, it's mm. a give and take where the person, you know, gets to promote what they came to do, but at the same time, now we got a good conversation out of it as well, you know? And that's what people want to hear. You know, how many times are you gonna ask somebody about their musical influences or things, you know, things of that nature? How'd you get your yep. start in the industry? I mean, that's that's all interesting and it has its place, but at the end of the day, it's not showing somebody as a human. You know, I think that they, they do a great job at that. You know, they do a great job at, I don't want to say exposing, because that has a negative connotation, but, uh, showcasing who somebody you know really is you know if they're a crazy person they're, you're gonna, it's gonna come out in the breakfast club you know uh you know <laughs> Let's but say peel back layers <laughs> right exactly exactly so, you know you you go into and you really get a good feel for who somebody is i think uh especially like that second takashi 69 interview um i think like when people walked away from mm -hmm. watching that one it was like whoa this is like a real dude you know what i mean like regardless of what you felt about it I think a lot of people started feeling some sort of, you know, like empathy or they looked at him like a real person. You know what I mean? There was something interesting mm -hmm. about, about that, the way that, you know, that, that interview came across. And, you know, that's something that is what makes them special. You know, they weren't looking for the crazy moment where he wilds out and does all these things. It was like, like they allowed him to have a real conversation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Well, like flipped on the other side, let's mm -hmm. say if I'm an artist, right. And I yeah. want to make sure that, I give off of a good interview, like the things that are in my control, mm -hmm. right? How do I make sure that I come off well, right? What, 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 what should I do differently based on the people I you've mean, seen I, who've done, you know, good and bad? I think at the end of the day, you can't walk in there trying to be too cool for the room, you know? Um, you, you gotta just allow yourself to be relaxed. And it's tough, it's nerve wracking, especially in an environment like that, man, it's breakfast club. You know, everybody <laughs> dreams about being on there. There's, there's no getting around that. But yeah. I think, you know, we live in an age of transparency. And if you're trying to give off this persona of perfection or whatever the case may be that isn't you, it, it's very obvious to the audience, you know. And, and um, you know, I think what makes them so special, like you're talking about when they allow people to be humanized, it's when people allow themselves to also come across as human, you know what I'm saying? Um, and it allow you to really just showcase your personality and don't try and be the cool rapper who's, you know, this rich dude, this and that. It's like allow yourself to, to open up, you know, I mean, obviously as much as you're comfortable with, but that's what is going to make people really mess with you even more is when they kind of really see like, okay, well, what is this person all about? You know, um, there are times where I'll, there'll be like a rapper that'll come in that I'm not like particularly a fan of or, or I don't get. And then I'll, I'll like, when it's over, I'm like, damn, that's like, that's a smart dude. You know what I mean? Like he, you know, knows what he's doing. He's been on his grind. And like, that makes me, that makes me go check out their album, to be honest with you a lot of times. Where it could gotcha. be somebody that I never liked them, you know, had an interest in checking out the music. But after the interview, I was like, yeah, I, I kind of want to see what they're all about now because I saw a side of them that I really didn't expect to kind of see, you know? Yo, I think that's huge, man. People <laughs> slip on the impact of an interview because there's been tons of people mm -hmm. where when I can see how they think, it definitely might encourage me to go check out their music or whatever they do yeah. in life. And then, of course, now you can even hear the music a little bit differently because you understand yeah. where it's coming from with that context versus absolutely whatever I mean, just sounded like before. Look at, I mean, look at somebody like Nipsey Hussle. You know, I think his music. You know, yeah. he, he he you know, this last project was great, but he transcended that because he was so open. He was talking real stuff. You know what I mean? Like. You could, uh, you know, watch his interviews as just somebody to, you know, get some game from. You know what I mean? Like, regardless of what you thought about his music, like, you could still be a fan of Nipsey Hussle because he was deeper than, than just the music thing, and he allowed himself to showcase all that, you know? Um, and I think that that is what transcends, you know, people becoming this, you know, actually somebody that, that people can mess with for a long period of time, you know, because you are being more than just some dude from the hood who, you know, has some sort of crazy stories about how – he used to be on the block or whatever, whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like that we've heard that story a million times at this point, you know, but there's gotta be more depth to it. You know, there's gotta be, when we see somebody like, 
YG, you know, maybe breaking down, talking about Nipsey or something like that. Like, yo, that makes you like be a fan of him a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Like behind, you know, he is like this dude from the streets, but he is also a real dude at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I think that that, that that really gives you like this extra edge when you're able to really open up and just hone in on, on, you know, showcasing who you are. People might be a fan of you, even if they don't love your music. Now you actually just have a fan who always just checks out your stuff because of that. You know what I mean? Cause they maybe don't like the last project, but because they mess with you as a person, they're going to keep looking for whatever that next thing is and hope that they like the next project at least, you know? Oh yeah. I like that. Yeah. You, you keep, it's, it's, it goes back to brand, man. Mm-hmm. Like I always say, when you're not hot, your brand is your insurance. Yeah. Like, like if your music ain't popping in the streets, but people still rock with you, they're gonna give you another chance. Right. You know what I mean? And they're always are gonna be looking for a reason to rock with you. As <laughs> you know yo, I mean? look, look at like two chains. You know what I mean? Like maybe his music hasn't been hitting the way it did, but he has the show on Vice Land, and like people just mess with him as a person. You know, Action mm-hmm. Bronson, same kind of thing. Like Action Bronson never really popped like gigantically. You know, as he maybe, you know, some people thought he would or whatever it is, but regardless of what you think about his music, you see his personality and like the show he has with the cooking and all this stuff. It's like, you know, you, yep. you give yourself the opportunity to be multifaceted and, you know, when need be to, to be able to pivot into different areas and different arenas, you know? Yeah, 100%. That's, that's the career long game versus, right. again, that short game, as you alluded to earlier, which brings Absolutely. me, you know, back to the fact you, you started the Dream Dealers podcast. So to be clear, what was the thought process behind Dream Dealers podcast? Was this, hey, I know that I really want to pursue storytelling, but what did it start as a project almost just to get some reps in? Um, a little bit. I had been on another podcast um, that was more of just like fun. Like we get drunk with artists and interview them. And, you know, it had a little <laughs> bit of depth, but it was more of like a, a fun thing. And I just knew I, yeah. I felt myself like leaning towards wanting to be able to give people more value, you know? Mm. Uh, and at the same time, I think for me, one of my biggest, I don't know if it's a calling, whatever you want to call it. I think I love social media, but I hate the way most people use it. You know what I mean? So to mm-hmm. me, I, I developed this because I was like, this gives me an opportunity to uh, do something. Because the, the podcast, for people don't know, I do it via Instagram Live. So, you know, we can connect right there. People can comment, this and that. It's back and forth kind of thing. And a lot of those people I didn't have a relationship with prior to the podcast. You know, I might have been from a DM, an email, whatever it is. So a side of it being something where I can put people on game. I also want to show that you can use these technologies, you know, and these things that are available to you in the right way to really create something real, you know? Um, and, and that's when most of the people that I focus on also were people that were do- using tech to, you know, uh, to build up the brand or to create their own businesses and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely was kind of the precursor to like what I kind of think my grandiose vision of it all is and the way I want to tell stories. Um, but yeah, so th- I think that, you know, in this social media era, uh, there's so much opportunity that that was like my first step into really be able to showcase and, and hopefully give people an insight, like, what can you do with what's at your, you know, at your fingertips, as opposed to just using it as something to flex and give people, you know, the perception that you're doing more than you actually are. <laughs> hey, well, hey, by the way, man, yeah. I'm mentioning that you did it over IG live. That was super dope that you had a podcast over IG live. Cause when you were like, you know, t- telling me about the conversation, but then you mentioned IG, IG Live, but you said the words podcast. I was confused. I didn't know how the hell you were going to do a podcast right. over IG Live. I didn't know how that was set up. I hadn't seen that. I've, of course, I've seen IG Live conversations. Like people just hop on, but I never saw like a pre-recorded, and, well, I mean recorded and packaged podcast right. out of that. Was that, um, like, were, were, did you have like a back-end technology off, off of that? Or was that just an app you were using? How did you even do that? Um, yeah, I was, so I have like a audio interface in my studio and I would basically just run from the iPhone, the audio into the interface. And then I would have a separate mic plugged in as well. That was going into the interface and we were all report onto like my recording software, which I use Ableton. Uh, and then I can go back and, and I'd also, um, screen record the interview on my iPhone. So, uh, that's uh, how I got the video okay. aspect of it as well. Um, but it was, I mean, I liked it because I think it gave people, an, uh, like, a sense of urgency where you had to tune in at a specific time, which I think is something that is fleeting in the world we live in right now. Mm, um, yeah. And it's like, if you want to be a part of the conversation, tune in at this specific time, you know what I'm saying? And it gave yeah. you the opportunity to be in real time. And then also, you know, obviously we live in an on-demand culture. So it allowed the other aspects of it as well, where I can package it after and, and release it as a regular podcast as well. But um, you know, for those who want to be a little bit more interactive, it kind of gave you both options. Okay. 
Yeah, man, I, I definitely appreciated how you did that. Then the the, the post production and all that stuff, the packaging was real slick. You make it so somebody wants to post those snippets, man. Come on, like how can I not post those well branded snippets, man? That's that's everything. That's the key. I mean, I, I got to keep you in mind as well, you know. So at the end of the day, it's like it's a cross promotion, you know. So me, the cool thing about IG Live is it doesn't go out to not only my followers, but if you and I are on there, it goes out to your followers as well. So now the mindset behind that is. Now your people are not checking me out. They don't probably don't know who the hell I am. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. now I have your followers laying their eyes on me and vice versa. You know, so that, that, you know, helped me gain more of an audience as well, where people are like, Oh, I don't know who this dude is, but I like the conversation. Yeah. Let me go check out what he's doing now, you know? Mm -hmm. And also then sending you professional clips, sending you professional things to, to do that. That also allowed me to get value after the fact, you know, where I can send you stuff that gives you value, gives you content for your, um, your socials and at the same time, you know, when you tag me in something, it's going to send people back to my page now too, you know? So it's like that reciprocal kind of thing. I wanted to make sure I did something that gave both of us value so that we both continue to support each other. You know what I mean? So if I, if I do something, if I give you some trash stuff that you're not going to post, it's not really valuable to me, you know, but if I take the time to, to make sure the quality of the content is good, then that means that's the potential for us both to be getting value out of it, you know? 100% man. I think that's, I mean, that's the name of the game, right? The win-win is always going to be <laughs> the, yeah. be, the best way to go. And Absolutely. Now, talking about your interviews, man, like outside of my interview, of course, man, what what, what has been some of the dopest moments in, in terms of your personal interviews or just dopest people you feel like you've gotten able to, to talk to? Man, um, there's been some good ones. I, I, I love the conversation with Humble the Pope. He's done the Breakfast Club a couple of times. Um, I recommend anybody to, to check, check out his book, Unlearn. He just has a really unique perspective on life and just like if you want to get a little bit more spiritual and, and kind of, you know, dive into some of the things that go along with, you know, the hustle and all that stuff is cool. But, you know, a lot of times it messes with your mental. So to really be able to dial in on that kind of stuff was, was dope. Um, I'd say um, the interview with uh, Sweetie's manager was cool because that was right at the time when my type was like bubbling up just a little bit. And it was literally like right after that interview, like boom, she blew up to the world. And I'm, not because of me, but it was cool to to be at that point to feel like I was a part of that, you know, moment right there. You know, um, I, I remember after that interview, I, I like pushed really hard at the radio station, like yo, like my type, like sweetie, sweetie's dope. Like you guys should really check out her story. And like, and that when this record kind of started bubbling up, so it was like a perfect storm. You know, um, I'm gonna take any credit for anything that happened with it, but. Uh, you know, I think I definitely was able to get in, you know, maybe people like Emmy's ear and things like that to really look at the, the record a little bit more and like, and, and play it in his mix and stuff like that, you know. Uh, I mean, he's gonna do that on his own, but I think definitely having a, a co-sign helped out. Um, so that was definitely like a cool moment for me. Uh, and, and to hear kind of her story and how, how they really built her up and, and how she had this whole vision of how she wanted to do things and the talk of ownership as an artist and to kind of see it in real time happening as it was building that to me, that was like something that I'm definitely fond of and it happened to be my my first episode, you know, so that was, that was definitely a good one. Yeah. Hell of a way to start, man. Yeah. I, brought it, though, it was, I was supposed to interview her first. And, um, that was that actually, I think especially me too, because it, it made me like, you know, persevere where I was supposed to interview her twice. And this is the thing that's tricky about the IG live thing is you put up the flyer, tell people tomorrow, 7 PM. Well, then like the day of comes and I think she had to fly out for something. So it was like, damn, now people might think I'm a liar. Now that I was going to be interviewing sweetie, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and unfortunately and this, again, when the song started popping, so now she's like running around and, you know, within the span of like two weeks of me booking it now her whole schedule has changed. Um, oh. so it got to the point where she had to cancel, she had to cancel again the day of, and I, you know, I had to hit up her manager, like Max, and I was like, bro, I, I know, you know, she's really busy, but can I at least, can I get, at least get you on here so that you can give me your perspective. Mm. And that's how we I'm interviewing him, you know, um, and, and it turned out to be a great interview, but I think it, it also taught me to just keep rolling with the punches and like, don't allow yourself to, to kind of give up, you know, figure out a way to, to keep it going and, and to keep it moving so that, uh, you know, you don't fail publicly, I guess, but uh, it, it was just a good kind of a perseverance moment for me. <laughs> That's what's up, man. I think yeah. it's, it's interesting to hear you say that, man, because I feel like the, that, that figuring it out and turn, figuring out how to turn you know, you could call them losses into right. some some semblance of a win, right? Yeah. And having a specific idea in as far as what you want to do in mind are two of the important yeah. most important things to to have in the entertainment industry because there's yeah. so many opportunities, so many random ways to make money, 
like right. so many different characters, you know, from all sides, you know what I mean? Good, bad, right. ugly, all that stuff. And you can easily get lost in the sauce if you don't have your own mindset and principle that you want to run run to. Mm-hmm. And also, of course, if you can't execute and, and had a drive to, to roll with the punches, because even the way you talk and recall that instance right there, yeah, like I, I commend you because so many people get like bitter. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, we'll be like, ah, you know, she said she and she and right. she ducked me two times, and that's it. You know what I <laughs> right. mean? That's the whole story. Like, yeah. but you you understood situation, blah blah blah, and you you got the manager right, and and and, and took no problem with that. So, like, I think that's dope, man. What are, what are your what what what's your personal philosophy, man, in terms of how you move and and just mm-hmm. handle like life and in business i mean i think at the end of the day it all it all starts with the idea that i, I want to wake up every day and you know not feel like that dread of going to work you know obviously there's gonna be certain days um mm. where you feel that way but for the most part you know i had jobs that i hated i know what that feeling feels like i never want to feel it again um <laughs> yeah. you know and and it also is at the same time i want to strive for greatness so i don't want to ever i don't want to just be a struggling artist for my entire life either you know um, you know, and it's trying to find the balance within the two, but then at the same time, you, like you were, you were saying, you know, there are, I don't know, and I'm paraphrasing here, but kind of shady characters within this world and this industry and, you know, different things you have to look out for and that might, you know, tear you down a little bit. Um, it's, you know, knowing that I don't want to operate that way either, you know, I want to win the right way. And I think that that's always something that I keep in, in the back of my mind is, you know, winning the right way and, and knowing that I'm better when it comes, when I'm able to collaborate, you know, and, and understanding myself that uh, my ability to collaborate, my want to collaborate, my want to give people a platform, I want to uh, meet people, learn from people, you know, that is always going to take me in the right direction. So it's always trying to push myself to to learn, you know what I mean? Even if it's not necessarily something that's immediately something I want to do, I want to know, I want to study other people's mindsets, you know, I want to do all that kind of stuff. And that's always what's helped me journey is, you know, uh, being unafraid to, to ask, for th- ask for help, you know, uh, or put myself in a position to learn um or to, to strive to learn something and then also when it com- comes down to it not being shy to put in the work and, and to pull the trigger when it's time you know you can only do research and, and learn for but so long and then you have to actually go and execute at that point 100 percent, man what is what does studying look like to you mm. man i'll go down wormholes of like youtube videos for hours bro that's how i, I that's how i originally <laughs> yeah. found you you know um you can put a topic oh. you got there that i'm like oh it's tough and then i'll go down a wormhole and i'll watch before they were famous stuff, you know, type of stuff. And like before I was with the breakfast club, I used to watch their interviews and study game on people I thought was interesting that they were interviewing and learned about that. Uh, I used to study interviews that Charlemagne did, that Envy did, that he did to learn about their journey, how they did what they did. You know, I think it's always important to, you know, find some people that you find interesting and then reverse engineer what they did. Um, you know, that, that's a big key is, is, okay, what was their path? You know, okay, how can, what can I take? Away, what tip it's going to take away you know it, it, it's it's kind of like you can you know find that in books and think i really read books and stuff like that and maybe in some books i don't read the whole book but i'll go through and find okay this chapter is interesting i think it speaks to what i want to know boom pull that tidbit you know and, and find little pieces of, of everything you can do so and and it's also meeting people man i i always want to put myself in a position to meet people you know the, to the best of my ability i'll always try and meet up if somebody's like yo i'm in new york let's link up cool you know, I always, I'll, I'll travel and I always try to hit up random people on Instagram and just be like, yo, I'm in your city, you know, for this time. Like, would you want to, you know, get, grab a, a drink or coffee, whatever it is? Because I think it's always interesting to see how people do things, you know, see how their mind operates a little bit and what can you kind of take away from it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, man, I think, like, that's one of the things that I got to do better sometimes is the meeting people. Right? I, I, mm. I'm, I'm so heads down and in, in work. Sometimes I have to actually like plan for myself to just yeah you know d- detach in terms of digital and get back into some some mix you know what i mean <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's definitely tough I, I think it's it's balance of it all it's like you have to find the in-between space between being super you know tied into what's going on in the digital space but then also knowing how yeah. to utilize that in the real world as well you know um and and even like i, I we were saying before we got i was in uh, puerto rico this last weekend and bro, I, was, I just went out there and was like meeting anybody that was doing anything creative, artists, there were people who own clothing stores, you know, music, whatever it is. I was just like finding people on IG and like hitting up, like, yo, I'm in town, you want a link? Uh, and like I found this area that is like this cool, just like artist haven where you got a lot of like artists and 
uh, musicians and like clothing, you know, designers and things like that. And it was cool to see the way they're like hustling right now to like create their own world. You know what I mean? Uh, well, different bars and restaurants and it's all owned by, by young people, you know, and they're like creating their mm. own world here in this area that was originally the hood that was like basically left to be rotted away, you know? And they're creating their own scene and it's super inspiring to see all these co-op spaces that people are sharing like this space and like there's three or four boutiques and they have a coffee shop inside. It's like, you know, like seeing people create all that kind of stuff. Now I'm like learning, I'm thinking, okay, how can I take that? And like, even if I'm not necessarily doing it in a literal form, how can I create my own co-op and whatever I'm trying to do, whether it is a collective with other artists or whatever it may be, like, what can I take away from the way they're utilizing each other's resources and networks to, to kind of bring it to my own world as well? So what is a co-op? Technically, I just want to make sure I understand that. So they'll, let's say, get a commercial space um, and it'll be, be like uh, one in particular was like a two floor space or whatever. Downstairs, they had like a coffee shop and like uh, and then like a little clothing boutique upstairs was like three or four clothing boutique booths, basically. So what they'll all do is instead of it being one person paying the rent, they all basically chip in and pay for the rent for the space and they all run it together, basically. So you have, you know, let's okay. say four or five different people that, you know, have different clothing brands or ideas and things like that. And they're all in it together uh, to be able to afford this space. And, and they all work sense. together, keeping it and, you know, and yeah, and they might rotate out like, okay, well, you know, this booth is leaving this month. Now we're going to bring a new person. So it's like they all are working together to create ideas and create a space for whatever it is that they're selling or doing, you know? So, okay. Nah, yeah. I, I definitely am all for something like that, man. Just always trying to figure out how to, like a lot of stuff that we think we can't yeah. do. It's just because right. we try to do it alone. <laughs> and I've been learning yeah, that I mean, more and more. It's absolutely true. I mean, imagine if you were like, you wanted the brand man network to grow into, uh, you bought a commercial space and within that, it was like you had a studio and then like a graphic design studio, whatever it is, like a video, you know, set. Yeah. And all these things. And you're an artist in there who are all contributing to it. Like imagine, you know what I'm saying? Like that is like the concept of it, you know? Um, because maybe by yourself, you couldn't afford like this commercial space, but you're talking about you get 10 heads in there who are all, on the grind and are doing creative things and are coming up with ideas on how you can keep making money every month to keep it alive. That is, you know, that's a huge thing to be able to have, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. You're definitely giving me some ideas. For sure. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, Hey, what made you go to Puerto Rico, by the way? Um, well, I'm Puerto Rican. So I, I've been going there since I was a kid. Uh, my family is from there, but, uh, I've, I've always had a connection to it, but I also, I went there in November with my family and I kind of, I kind of started seeing the sign of like these artists, blow, you know, happening and creating their own spaces, you know, and it's kind of like, uh, I saw it happen when I, in Brooklyn, uh, when it started becoming, you know, you started getting a lot of the artists turning the areas around and creating cool stores and, and studios and things like that. Um, and I started seeing the signs of it in, in, in certain areas of Puerto Rico. Uh, so I was super interested. I, like, I want to go meet these guys who have like these streetwear company, you know, brands that they developed on the island, things like that. Uh, and it, it kind of felt like, what if I was able to capture some of these moments when it was just starting to bubble up? Like, what if you were able to be in Atlanta when it, that scene was just kind of starting up? You know what I mean? Like, we all hear about these stories about like what it was like when this one spot was like the Monday night open uh, open mic spot where all like the people came out of, you know, it's like, or uh, yeah. I, I watched like, uh, I can't remember the name of the show, it's about Netflix, but it's like the, where they go through the history of hip hop and like different scenes and things like that. Um, and it was like, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Washington Square Park, I think it was where you would have like Talib Kweli and, and then the most deaf and all these guys like, you know, freestyle. And that was like a scene just to hang out. Like imagine if you were able to go there when that was like starting to pop off, you know, starting to bubble up. So I kind of, I, I feel like that's what's happening over there. And it was super interesting to me and just having the cultural connection to it, um, you know, really kind of drove me to want to go check it out firsthand. And, you know, it's something I plan on, on doing, uh, you know, more often. And then even seeing what's happening musically on the island where you're having these giant art, you know, you're having artists like Bad Bunny, like just transform the world, you know what I mean? Um, coming from a small island like that and his music, you know, it, is transforming you know how he wasn't even talking to english on the card to be i like it record but his verse after hers is one of the more popular ones it's just like a dj you know, when you play it you know what i mean uh so yeah. you're seeing all, all, all these things happen you know and so it, it's definitely like it's cool to kind of see that go try and get a, a feel for, for what's going on over there uh and you know maybe be a part of a scene you know if you can while, while it's kind of in its uh starting phases gotcha gotcha yeah that's dope man i, I definitely just think about 
things that I had missed because of age, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then like, man, I wonder what it was like, you know, to be in the scene when Big Boy and Andre were in Atlanta, like, coming yeah. up. It's like not, you know, I was right. there. I wasn't there to hang out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I wonder what it would have been like to be right. 18, 20 years old in 96, 97. You know what I mean? That's a, that's a, that's a vibe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm like, no. oh. Absolutely. I mean, we had uh, Sam Jackson on the show. He was talking about how at one point in New York, you had like him, Denzel, like all the, you know, those guys. And they were doing like Broadway. They were doing like, not even Broadway, but they were like low, you know, low budget plays in like New York. And you can see them all hanging out in the street like that. You know what I'm saying? Like at that time, like imagine if you were to be a fly on the wall and just like go seeing some of the greatest actors, of, you know, uh, in history at, at that point when they were like cutting their teeth and like building their craft, you know, like how crazy that have been to be a part of that. That was you know, it's cool. There's these scenes that happen and you got to be able to pay attention to what's going on and catch them when they're happening. It's super crazy, man. It's always in those concentrated areas where the talent just starts to really trickle in and infrastructure builds out that you you see that kind of thing happen, man. I'm always trying to figure out where are those and making yeah. sure that, you know, I'm a part of in some form or fashion or at least pay attention to it and learn from. Yeah, I mean, look at even... Uh, I was been like doing my own like you know deconstruction of like the uh, lyrical lemonade brand, you know what I mean? Um, mm. And and they and they built up when that whole Chicago drill scene was happening, you know, and and basically were like a local blog for Chicago at that time, you know. So like he he yeah. was a part of a scene while it was happening, was the only person talking about it, you know, and and then eventually boom started blowing up from there, you know. So all that kind of stuff is interesting to me. It's like to, to just see things when it's happening. That's when it's the most exciting at that point, you know? 100%, man. 100%. And I, the, it's interesting how you have some of these scenes that kind of organically happen or mm -hmm. and then some of them, a lot of them, they are organic, but it's still a, it's like a central figure. Like if you think about a Barry Gordy in the mm -hmm. Motown, which is ridiculous how many people yep. were up in that thing. Absolutely. And then, you know, Outcast, Dunn, family. There was a, a, a few figures. New York. There's the well, Russell, uh, mm -hmm. Rick Rubin. Prior mm -hmm. to them, the whole Sugar Sugar Hill. It's, it's, yeah. it's always takes that talent, but then it always takes a few minds to right. understand what's happening. Just like you understand what's happening in Puerto Rico, and yeah. you see it, and then kind of create a little bit of infrastructure to guide that vision. Because there's a lot. There's a lot of talent everywhere. Yeah. Really. You know what I mean? But if nobody knows how to channel uh, channel that and exploit yeah. it to be honest yeah then it won't be able to flourish yeah there's always going to be the precursor like there's always going to be the person who like lays down that foundation like you'll you'll see it in hip-hop and different styles and things like that. there's always gonna be that one person who like was like every night was like the figure that you know started off but for whatever reason they didn't pop off you know what i mean and there's always mm. stories like that and and then it's the next person who learned how to okay take what made that that work for them and then how now do you figure out a way to feed it to the masses you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like there's always that there's always that person who figures out a way to do that you know uh and that's what that's what's super interesting you know some people like might say that oh somebody sounds like this person blah, blah blah they might have taken some things from them but then they figured out how to also blow it up even bigger you know how to, how to make it tenfold what it was and that's like the 100%. interesting thing about those those whole scenes and everything for for sure man Definitely. <laughs> it's always, yeah, you're right. It's always like the multiple sides. Some, some, somebody might be bitter. Somebody, you know, right. might be super successful, all that stuff. Cool. Well, all right. Well, let's kind of round it out with, with this, man. I'm interested mm -hmm. to know like the, this year, just, mm -hmm. just this year, right. How are you mentally approaching like 2020 and how you would like to navigate towards it like what what actually i'll phrase it like this what kind of like a self-awareness have you a process have you gone through to say i was doing this before and this is how i want to allow myself to level up in this year to achieve these ne this next level of goals i think um th going into this year i know that it's a year of change for me um mm -hmm. and I, I kind of, you know, you, when you get attached to certain things uh, that are big or certain ideas, this and that, it, it can become scary to, to pivot even when you kind of feel it in your gut, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I think for me, I'm now at a place where I know it's time for me to pivot and kind of find my own voice within everything, you know? Um, 
and and we had been talking about you know um me trying to do more like on camera personality type of stuff and, and that's definitely something i'm going to be pursuing you know more of uh and that is a bit of a pivot you know because i was doing more radio stuff and that was what i kind of saw myself doing was the whole radio thing um and i, I kind of haven't changed that but also i'm also coming to the year super open to like whatever kind of comes away you know at this point i've laid down a pretty solid foundation of what i can do i've shown that i can you know show up and, and deliver uh on the big stages you know and now i'm kind of just in a point where i want to put myself in like this end of the loop and just kind of see what the hell kind of pans out what works at this point you know and keep doing what i've been doing um but at the same time force myself to go into the unknown as well you know so it's again the puerto rico trip was just the start of that you know i plan on traveling to a bunch of places like that but um seeking out the creativity finding out where maybe things uh you know getting inspired to try some different things and who knows for us maybe leave new york maybe go somewhere else i don't really know right now but uh right now is the year of change and i think it's it's just thrusting myself into a million different things educating myself on everything that's happening and, and seeing where that kind of leaves me you know oh dope it's an exploration phase mm -hmm. but yeah i mean you you know you learn i've learned a lot I, I have a good mindset going into things and i think now it's time to you know see where i can utilize it you know it's the same thing we talked about just now where somebody laid the foundation and then you have to figure out how to bring it to a different thing you know what i mean um so that's where that I, I i saw the you know what these guys have done i've seen that the mindset that it took to do that and now i need to apply it somewhere else that is my own lane at the end of the day you know mm. yeah yeah i can i really appreciate that man because for one just throwing yourself into that i know it which is a necessary process at certain periods right you, you have your growth yeah you, you hit your growth spurt then it gets stunted after a period you stop it's yeah like, all right i have to push myself out there to right. figure out what these next things are and then sometimes it's not a direct connection to the next monkey bar it's like i'm yeah. just out here <laughs> like i don't know where it's coming from right, right. like to so to go through that man is it's definitely i've been there before and to know that you're like mm -hmm. running through that period and i know i'm gonna have to do that in some form or fashion again is yeah. is really dope to see you you know really kind of going into that like in good spirits and taking it head on especially understanding that is strategic right you, yeah. you know that you want to build for your own but you know that it can't necessarily happen where you are now so you got to figure right. out where that next thing is absolutely man i think you, you can't fear change you can't fear change you can't fear the idea of pivoting i mean pivoting is what got me into radio i was djing that was my main thing you know mm -hmm. and then once that i saw that door for radio kind of back open I, I saw it was and i liked it I, I dove into that you know what i mean i put everything towards that um you know and now that i've done the whole radio thing i've done this whole thing i uh it's it's you know now okay where is that next door cracked open you know now it's time to pivot again you know now it's time to elevate myself to that next level you know uh because i think you can't ever look back on these things as you know maybe it didn't pan out exactly how you thought it would or whatever because you know it's going to pan out the way it's supposed to pan out it's not going to pan out the way you have in your head obviously goals ideas are all fantastic but you can't allow yourself to get so attached to those things, um, you know, that you no longer know how to shift out of things. You know, it, it's like there are some people who maybe aren't the most talented rapper, let's say, but their branding is so good. You know what I mean? Their personality is incredible. Um, and there probably will come to a point where uh, when the music stuff isn't hitting, they need to learn how to pivot somewhere else, you know, that is more mm -hmm. suits them. It's the same thing with the Action Bronson thing, you know. Obviously, he has a fan base. He can tour and do all that kind of stuff. But he's talking about on a massive level. He's not a, you know, a commercial massive success. You know what I mean? But he pivoted, and people love his personality. You know what I mean? Like people mess with him on that level, and he was able to pivot into a niche that you know, uh, use what you the platform you've built up from this world, and then go ahead and take into a new world. You know what I mean? And and that's a you know a beautiful thing to to be able to do. And it's having the self awareness to know, okay, I'm I'm hitting that ceiling right now. You know what I mean? Maybe yeah. my my hard work and perseverance is taking me to this point, but that's as far as it might take me in this realm. Uh, and where is the next connection that, you know, I can move on to that next phase that allows me to utilize all that I learned and then also elevate myself to that next, you know, uh, version of myself, basically. That's, that's everything, man. You're actually hitting the core with me because in the same way you talked about how people lay a foundation and then, you know, somebody else comes and how to, take it to the next level, especially, you know, in some situations that first person might even be unknown or never becomes big. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, less the general term big for the sake of big. But right. when I do certain things in certain areas where I feel like I am laying foundation, mm -hmm. I actually have a mentality of when done right, of course, at some point, the, the time get pa gets passed mm -hmm. and it, you know, that next person blows it up on a whole another level or just the next generation blows it up on a whole another level. But yeah. in the meantime, I want to be able to lay foundation, step back and analyze myself, uh, blow and exploit myself, like really do that back yeah. to myself versus allowing myself to get, you know, get comfortable and waning away and becoming that person in the corner that just didn't, right? Like that person that didn't really max out their um, opportunities. Because a lot of times with some of these people, these opportunities and these things were there. Yeah. They just saw it differently. They were feeling themselves too much through where they didn't see that you had to keep going, right? right. They thought it was over. Nobody else could be be bigger than them or right, whatever, you know? And I'm not, I'm less of a, although obviously I am in front of the camera in my own way, I'm not necessarily an artist where it's like, hey, I'm trying to be huge personality wise, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Public figure wise to that extent, but just infrastructurally from business to some of the personality type of things I do, the way I want to connect things, it's like I lay foundation, mm -hmm. I analyze, and I'm always trying to figure out where am I fucking up? Where am I? Yeah. Where am I leaving a gap for somebody else to come in and do it even better than me? Not and not, mm -hmm. you know, in their own way. That's cool. Take your inspiration, do it in their own way, but doing it how I I should be doing it, right? Right. Right. <laughs> like yeah. that's the part that I try to avoid. No, that's yeah. smart, man. It is it's it's self-evaluation. You know what I mean? That you have to constantly be self-evaluating. Like what is working, what isn't working, what's making me happy, what's not making me happy. Like you know, where can I improve? Where am I excelling? You know, you have to constantly force yourself to do that because if you don't, you're just going to get too comfortable. And then next, you know, the ground's going to be pulled out from under you. You know what I mean? And there's going to be, like you said, another dude on YouTube who's doing, uh, you know, more numbers than you now is taking the same concept you did because you never chose to improve what you were doing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, or, or anything, you know, or if you are a producer who got stuck making the same exact type of beats, eventually somebody's going to come take your spot as that new hot producer because you didn't, uh, you know, elevate yourself. You got too comfortable, uh, you know, make getting these checks for a certain type of beat and eventually that sound, you know, goes away. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it, it's, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, even look at um, somebody like Hitmaker, you know what I mean? Like he, you know, is killing as a producer right now, you know what I'm saying? And and also he's doing A&R for Atlantic, you know, so he is pivoting. He's not afraid to, you know, he's pivoting and, and finding success now that he has allowed himself to be open to, not just being, you know, the dude at the forefront, but also being the dude behind the scenes who's pulling the strings and, and uh, you know, putting things out there, you know, so you can't be afraid of that. And I look at, uh, you know, Charlamagne, before I met him, I read his first book and he talks about how he was, you know, rapping at one point and he, you know, had gotten the attention of like a local record label and things like that and was seeing moderate success with it just based upon his work ethic more than so than his talent. Um, but then, you know, it got to a point where I think the, the guy who he considers his mentor was a label owner was like, you need to go back into that radio stuff. That's what you're calling it, you know? And, mm -hmm. you know, he was unafraid at that point where he was hit with the realization that his work ethic got him as far as it could because his talent wasn't able to match that, you know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. That, because that you have talent somewhere else, that means, you know what I'm saying? And the second your, your work ethic is in, uh, in line with where your talent actually lies, then that's when you're going to be hitting stride. And that's why what happened with him is that's why uh, the one thing I take away from Charlamagne's story is that is in, un he was unafraid to pivot, then dove all in in radio, and it, that took off. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it took that connection that rap gave him, meeting that guy to put it in that perspective for him. And he probably met a lot of people along the way doing that, but then took that and utilized it somewhere else. And his work ethic met his talent, and that's why he is where he is. You know? One hundred percent, man. Yeah, I love that idea. Remember, you, you might not always be where you're supposed to be, but make sure you learn something while you're there. That's Absolutely. For sure. Well, hey, man, is there anything that you want to leave the people with, man? Because you have so many good perspectives and like you've already, like I said, you got my mind thinking about quite a few things. Is there anything that you, any keys you want to drop on people or just where to follow you? Yeah, I mean, uh, both, but I would say, you know, I'm really big on people recognizing the power they have in their hands with this phone and please just start utilizing it 
the right way. You know what I'm saying? Like mm. really utilize it as a tool to get your stuff out there and then also get out the damn house once you've done it. You know what I'm saying? Like utilize it, <laughs> understand that, you know, use this thing to create opportunities and then bring those opportunities into the real world, you know? And there is no shame whatsoever in, you know, uh, not being that dude or you don't have to put on the show. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, that it's, un, and this is going to go to deaf fears, but hopefully it touches somebody, you know, where you, you don't have to put on this act that you're more successful than you are. You know what I mean? Because there's no point in it. You know, you're living a lie at that point. You're not going to be hundred percent happy. You know, if you're stunned and you're spending money on all this, this garbage just to make yourself appear to be more successful, you're hindering your own success at that point. You know what I mean? Like, like if you're popping bottles in the club to impress somebody, then that's, you know, what, three, four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars less you have in your bank account to actually put towards creating something real. You know what I'm saying? Like, like really think about things in, in real terms. We have to get over this whole thing of trying to put it on for people, put on the show for other people. Like it, it makes no sense at the end of the day because you're just going to keep putting yourself in the same position over and over again, you know. And I know it's tough. Like you want to be the dude that gets all the girls. You want to do that doing all these different things, you know. But in due time, if you make smart decisions in due time, that can be you if that is what your goal is at the end of the day, you know. Um, but you have to also just allow yourself to be, you know, humility is okay and, and failure is okay as long as you're learning something from it. And, you know, you don't need to put on this whole show. You know, the people that I respond to when I get DMs and things like that are the people that are real with me, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm like, I'm hustling, I'm trying to get do this, blah, blah, blah. Like, uh, I got an email the other day from some label. I'm not going to say the name, but it was like, yeah, the biggest independent label in all of New York City, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm why why is that even like the first tagline that you would put out there like to impress you know what i'm saying like what sense yeah. does that make you know what i'm saying like connect with somebody on a human level like be real it's okay like yo i'm, I'm struggling i'm hustling stuff you have to do you have any pointers for me like would you mind taking a second out of your day that is what's going to crack the code you know anybody who is out there putting you know mr millionaire as their you know handle on instagram you know what i'm saying they don't they're not a millionaire it's like bro you look corny like and anybody who is a thatcher is not seriously you know an actual million to be seriously because your ig handle is mr millionaire whatever the hell it is you know um so that's my that my biggest thing i think realize we live in an age of uh, of transparency man and you're gonna find that people are more likely to connect with you when you're just real about it uh and don't be afraid to collaborate man don't be afraid to bring in people there's no shame in being uh you know not as good as somebody at something you know what i'm saying like there's no shame in that as long as you uh because you trying to overcompensate for that is just going to put you behind when you could just collaborate with somebody who is great at something, you know what I'm saying? Um, maybe you're not yeah. the best at putting together, like, I do. You know, somebody's like a dope editor, not trash video. Yep. Seriously, like, be unafraid. I'm not good at this. Like, can I collaborate with you? Maybe I have something to offer you. We can go, you know, vice versa. If I don't have money to pay you or whatever the case may be. Like, put in that time. Like, there's no, there's nothing wrong with collaborating. Like, that's where you're going to, you know, get to be where you are. I mean, like a J and Dame Dash, like all these different, you're seeing the partnerships, like the people who are unafraid to like collaborate and put the things together. You know what I mean? Like that's really who is successful. You're trying to be too cool to, to you know, be open to learning something or collaborating with people. You just kind of shoot yourself in the foot. Um, but now I've gone on the whole tangent, but uh, I mean, you can follow me uh, on socials just at uh, DJ Dramos, D-R-A-M-O-S. Um, and I'm always kind of, I'm always connecting with people, man. I'm always trying to do something. So you know, people can always hit me up on there. And I do my best to get back to them, you know, if there's anything, any questions or, or anything like that. But yeah, I'm just super open to that kind of stuff. I just hope that people uh, really begin to realize the power they have and just stop BSing and, and wasting it on trying to look successful instead of actually being successful. Hey. That's it, man. I appreciate you once again. Everybody, again, as he said, follow DJ Drummond's, man. Watch this, watch this as he continues to develop. Um, and, and the things he's doing, he was already honest with you and told him that he's out here building. He's in an exploration phase. So that's this will be an opportunity for y'all to watch something like that in real time. Um, as always, of course, if you mm -hmm. like this video, go ahead and like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. It's the network. <laughs>